the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is risen. For the next several weeks, uh, we will be still specifically listening on Sundays to Gospels related to the day of the resurrection. This is one of them. We hear about the first day and then about the eighth day in this gospel. And the first day, of course, specifically refers to the resurrection of our Lord in this case. And the eighth day, when it is used in the New Testament, deliberately has this perspective of pointing to the age of the kingdom which is to come, of which we are members thereof. And here we have the disciples of Christ. They're gathered in an upper room, it seems. Perhaps it's the same upper room that they had met in a few days earlier when they gathered for that last supper that the Lord had with them before he went to his arrest, conviction, torture, crucifixion, and death. Perhaps it was somewhere else. We don't know that. But it says that the disciples were gathered and the doors were shut. Implication is locked. Why? Because they were afraid of the Jews, of their fellow men, their own people. Be like a bunch of Russians gathering and hiding in a space. Why? Because they were afraid of the Russians. <laughs> That's what the implication is. Family, friends, potentially now enemies because of their commitment they stepped over the line and went all the way with this man. And now they're afraid. And we see in the uh, Acts of the Apostles that we heard from earlier that after the Pentecost, they were pretty fearless. With the presence of the Holy Spirit in them, they weren't afraid to go stand in front of their fellow men. Going to the porch of Solomon at the temple where they were gathering to pray. The early disciples of the Lord didn't reject the temple. They continued to pray at the temple because that's what you did. And they did so until their brethren who were not followers of Christ refused them permission any longer to worship at the temple. But they had courage then Yet at this moment in time, they were afraid. They were puzzled. They were confused. Mary Magdalene, earlier in the day, had informed them that she'd met the Lord. Right. Sure you did. Peter and John had gone to the tomb. John was pretty sure he understood the reality. Peter still didn't get it. And they were gathered, trying to sort this all out. According to St. Luke and his gospel earlier in the day, having already heard from the women this curious tale of having encountered angels that pronounced that the Lord was risen, were walking along and they themselves had encountered the Lord and dashed back to Jerusalem and had, before the Lord appears, informed the other disciples they had, that Peter had encountered the Lord, that the Lord was risen, they'd met him, and they still were pretty confused. And suddenly, there's Jesus standing in their midst saying, peace be with you. And then made sure that they recognized that this was not a ghost, not a phantasm, 
but that it was in fact himself. And then says, and they were glad. And then he says to them one more time, peace be with you. And then he says, as the Father sent me, so I sent, send you. And the word in the Greek that he uses is the same word as apostle. The word apostle means one who is sent. Jesus himself is an apostle from his father, one sent from the father to us. And as he was sent from his father, so he sent his disciples. Guess what? We're all his disciples. We are all called not just to work on discipline, study, prayer, doing the worship services accurately and right in things, but we are also called to be sent out. What to do? To speak about the words of this life. The last two verses of the epistle today, when the angel comes to these apostles and disciples who are locked up for having proclaimed the gospel, have an angel of the Lord open the prison doors and brings them out and says, go stand in the temple and speak to the people. First of all, it's go. Be sent. I'm sending you. Go to the temple again. And then speak all the words of this life. And he's not talking about living in the world, living in Jerusalem, being alive here, but this life of which they are here to speak is Jesus. Jesus is the life that they are to speak of and to reveal. The first 12 apostles have a special designation because they are ones who had seen the Lord in his resurrection. They had seen the life. And then we have the 70 apostles who were sent out during the Lord's lifetime to go into the various towns and villages and proclaim the gospel, to reveal it through healings, casting out of demons and all these glorious things which life brings, the life our Lord Jesus Christ brings. But Thomas wasn't there. <laughs> and they get talking to him later and he's telling them, telling him, we've seen the Lord. He's alive. Yeah, right. Sure he is. <laughs> I won't believe it unless I see him face to face, can put my fingers into his wounds. Then I'll believe it. I won't believe you. I don't believe you. The icon there, we always talk about Thomas as being doubting Thomas, but the icon in front of us there has the words, the belief of Thomas. That's how the uh, Slavic churches, the Russian churches, uh, describe that icon. And the Greeks call that icon the touching of Thomas. Thomas desired to encounter him face to face and to touch him. And there's a wonderful akathis to Thomas which actually praises his doubt. Why does it praise his doubt? Because, number one, he overcomes it. And number two, he becomes an assurance for every single one of us who doubt. Because belief is awfully hard to do these days. There are too many things in our lives, and it goes right back to the Lord's time, that are working at trying to make sure you can't believe. The guards 
were told to go around and inform everybody that the disciples had stolen his body away, trying to work at convincing people that Jesus was not raised from the dead. And they were very effective at it, as we all know. We even have a whole religion that proclaims that Jesus did not die on the cross, but was stolen away, and then he took off and hid in India or wherever. The lies are out there. And when we put our trust in too much of the types of authorities that are out there these days, we are led astray. I know of a man who many years ago, when he was working for his father-in-law, went in to see his father-in-law in the blacksmith shop of his farm and his father-in-law said here catch this um, nail and he ca caught the nail which had just managed to get cool enough so that it was not red any more and burnt his hand and then his father-in-law laughed at him for being such a fool well tell me how much do you think this man trusted his father-in-law after that. And we have so many situations in which we have been taught things, spoken things that make it hard for us to believe. Many of us, most of us in one way or another have been told that we are not good enough, that we are not worthy in some way or another. And then to hear someone say to us, you are loved and forgiven, it becomes very hard for us to believe it. How is it that those of us who are present here today know that we are loved and forgiven by God? Well, you know, on one once aspect it says blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe but I believe that in one way or another even though we may not have seen the Lord himself specifically someone or some group of people have been able to show God's love to us in such a way that we could say I believe. I believe. We hear the Beatitudes every week, and those Beatitudes are an invent invitation. Try those things out. Try recognizing you are poor in, spe in, in spirit. Try being meek and see how that works. Try being merciful and see what happens. Try being a peacemaker. See what happens. And then try practicing that on a regular basis and watch the transformation that happens, first of all, in your own life. And someone has to have been able to say, hey, I've been trying that out, and you know what? It works. Well, it doesn't seem to work every time, but partly I guess i got to practice, and sometimes I f fail and I stumble, but it works. And who's the one who taught us this? It's our Lord. Believe. And don't be afraid to try. And don't be afraid of failing. It's like learning to ride a bicycle. You can do it. But I just crashed. Try again. You can do it. You can do it. God's love and mercy are there for us. What a tough week that has to have been for Thomas. Thomas. What's wrong with my brothers here? They're crazy. Or are they? They're crazy, or aren't they? How do I find out? How do I figure this out? And in his case, thank God, and I think it's partly because of his calling to be an apostle, one to have seen him resurrected, to be able to proclaim it. I saw it. 
I saw this resurrection. I saw this resurrection, resurrected man. I saw him ascend into heaven. And I received the Holy Spirit. And so can you. And it was important for us that Thomas went through what he went through. And he has been a great example to millions and millions of people. And oh, let me assure you that no matter how strong your faith is, someone's going to come along and attack it and tell you you're crazy and come up with all kinds of evidence and explanations as to why, how they feel, what they think, what they believe, trumps what the Christians believe, what they experienced. It's called the Antichrist. Anything that is not of the Lord and proclaims something different is Antichrist. And that doesn't mean against Christ. It means instead of Christ, a different message, a different good news, something that is not good news in reality. The serpent told Adam and Eve in the garden, <laughs> he's lying to you. Eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge and good and evil. He doesn't want you to eat of it because you will be like him if you do that. You won't need him. And in fact, in the eating of that fruit of the tree of knowledge and good and evil, they discovered how right God was and how wrong they had been. And something left them. Life left them. The life that comes through being in communion with the source of life which is beyond anything that we understand from a biological perspective, but which is part of what the fullness of all eternity and the cosmos is all about, which is all created by our Heavenly Father and His Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, with the power of the Holy Spirit. Christ is risen. Let us say with all our soul and with all our mind, let us say. Lord, have mercy. O Lord, o Lord, Almighty, the God of our fathers, we pray you, 